Okay. 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 <coughs> so let me introduce you. All right. This is Professor Lucas from Yale University. Matt Jonas today is why is he Professor Brady? This one's why is that So Dimitri is going to talk about um, two moments right now. Um, kind of like what Sylvie was doing, a lot of the different options available, elements, materials, stuff like that. Is that the process. Okay. 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 Okay, so uh, good afternoon. My name is Dimitrios Lignos. I'm sorry I can't be there, but uh, due to important family issues, uh, I have to uh, stick in Montreal for a while before I travel again. So uh, today I will talk about uh, modeling steel moment resisting frames with uh, open seas. And uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of uh, two of my graduate students for some of the slides, Ahmed Al Kadi and Samantha Walker. So. Um, so the agenda for uh, the presentation, I will uh, start with, uh, I will discuss about nonlinear modeling of steel moment resisting frames. I will uh, first uh, discuss about the major steel components that uh, we have to worry about uh, when we model a moment frame. Uh, then I will talk about uh, two options that we have, like uh, distributed plasticity and concentrated plasticity. Uh, and then, uh, more specifically, how can you actually uh, utilize nonlinear uh, force-based elements and as well as zero-length elements uh, uh, to pretty much model the same structure. And then I'll, I'll show you some uh, background related to uh, steel materials in open seas. And uh, then I will finally close the presentation with some examples, uh, comparisons and applications that uh, we have been working on with the concepts that you will hear. Um, so, uh, okay, so if you have a steel moment frame, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, primary three elements that uh, we are interested to uh, model uh, when we build a nonlinear model is uh, essentially, uh, oriented around, are essentially oriented around the joint and uh, in this case that you see on your uh, right, pic uh, right hand side picture, uh, essentially, uh, we have to uh, see what we can do with uh, beams of fully restrained moment connections, uh, columns, and uh, also the area in the center, which is called the panel zone. Uh, now, uh, more specifically, the reason why we have to deal with uh, these three locations is uh, primarily because um, uh, what you could see when we talk about beams uh, you will have uh, issues related to flex flexural yielding and uh, eventually buckling. Uh, then, you know, when we talk about columns, you can have flexural yielding uh, as well as axial yielding because these elements uh, actually see uh, axial load and bending at the same time. But also, the panel zone is uh, pretty important because uh, you can have uh, CR yielding and uh, this could be potentially a big problem uh, if you are dealing with um, uh, structures that are uh, not uh, designed, steel structures that are not designed with uh, modern code, code provisions. Okay, so uh, a little more about this. Uh, so uh, uh, the first uh, element, beam, beam plastic hinging, essentially uh, uh, we are dealing with uh, issues uh, pass yielding that. Uh, have to do with local buckling. So here you see an example uh, of a steel beam with a reduced beam section uh, after uh, 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 you know a certain um, a number of uh, inelastic cycles. Uh, the, it, it, its flanges as well as the web will buckle, and these are issues that you have to take into account when you actually build a nonlinear model uh, for a steel moment frame, or uh, when you look at uh, the figure here at the bottom. Uh, the other problem you could have is uh, lateral torsional buckling of uh, uh, beams with RBS. So again, these issues uh, have to be reflected in your uh, model. Uh, now, uh, when you uh, have a structure that uh, panel zones are um, actually uh, weak, uh, what happens is that uh, panel zone deforms in CR 
uh, similar to the picture that you see here. So again, if uh, you are dealing with a structure that uh, this component, uh, this deformation component is uh, important, you should be able to uh, take that into account uh, so that you can have a reliable uh, moment resisting frame model. And then finally, uh, if we are dealing uh, with uh, column plastic hinging, there you have, uh, uh, again, local buckling could be the primary failure mode, but because you have also axial load uh, applied in the column, uh, what happens is that once local buckling occurs, uh, you might have axial shortening that uh, you should somehow take that into consideration. Uh, so, uh, so these are the primary uh, issues that uh, you have to uh, consider when you want to build a nonlinear model in um, in uh, open seas. But the question now is, how can you do that? So. Uh, so there are various ways, uh, I mean, you must have heard a number of things uh, the past two days uh, related to simulation approach you could follow. So uh, you could use an approach uh, which is essentially uh, uh, concentrated plasticity based. So you are using a combination of uh, zero length elements or springs uh, and an elastic uh, beam in the center. Uh, or the other thing you could do is you could use a uh, distribu distributed plasticity approach. Uh, like one example is uh, uh, the element here with a finite length uh, hinge zone instead of a concentrated plasticity. Uh, or you could use more like a fiber-based approach similar to the one that you see here. Or you know if you want to actually uh, model the continuum like you can use a finite element approach but that's not what we want to do. Okay, now, um, um, so concentrated plasticity models, uh, so we have, I mean, the advantage, there are a few advantages to use them, like uh, they are fairly simple, but uh, so they, they, they are also effective for uh, interface effects, also computationally could be efficient, uh, but uh, there are a few uh, disadvantages uh, if you decide to go with this approach. So the first one is that uh, you are required to know the uh, moment rotation relationship uh, for the element that you are trying to actually uh, build a nonlinear component model, as opposed to engineering stress strain if you are actually using a distributed plasticity model. And another big uh, disadvantage is that uh, they don't capture the PM interaction, and you know for moment frames. This could be critical, uh, particularly for columns, uh, because the columns see excessive axial load um, uh, because of gravity or overturning effects during the earthquake. Okay. Now, um, uh, second, I mean the second category, distributed plasticity models. Uh, the uh, the issue is that uh, I mean you you can use a force or displacement based elements. I believe uh, Michael Scott must have talked about this and they permit the spread of plasticity and also PM interaction is not a problem, you can capture it. Okay, uh, some of the disadvantages, uh, localization, there are some ways to go around it, uh, requires a fiber section discretization and there you have to pretty much make sure that uh, you, you know how many fibers you are using because the number of fibers matters in terms of uh, what you are getting as an output. And uh, then there are a few other issues related to uh, degradation phenomena such as local buckling with existing models in open uh, existing material models in open seas is not uh, pretty much very difficult to capture uh, this effect. Uh, so that's uh, another issue. So um, uh, what I'll do is I'll discuss uh, both approaches uh, by using one example. So, um, and then uh, what I will do is, uh, depending on what, what I will show you, at the end, you know, I actually have some good comparisons so that you can see, you know, what's the, what are some of the limits with one approach, what are some of the limits with the other, and uh, you will get some good idea what you should be paying attention uh, uh, when you are modeling a moment frame. So, so I'm using a, a prototype frame that uh, we designed uh, with um, uh, current ASC 7-10 provisions and the AISC 2010 uh, seismic provisions. Uh, the, you can see the plan view in the upper left uh, figure 
of the uh, of your uh, of, the, of the slide and uh, uh, this uh, steel building has perimeter moment frames in both directions uh, and uh, here highlighted you see one of uh, the mod the moment resistant frame that I will pretty much model uh, with the uh, some of the concepts that I discussed uh, previously and then here on your right hand side you see the elevation view of uh, the four story uh, special moment frame and uh, <clears throat> because I'm building a two dimensional model I'm using a uh, linear column so I can carry the uh, gravity load uh, so that I can transfer the P-delta effect uh, uh, to the frame. A uh, few other things, uh, the building has uh, fully restrained uh, beam to column uh, connections with uh, reduced beam section. Uh, if you want more details about these connections, uh, you can look at the AISC 358-10 provisions or FEMA 350, but they are a bit outdated. And a couple of other things, the first mode uh, period of the structure is uh, 1.51 seconds, so it's a, you know fairly flexible. Okay. okay. Is the sound okay? Is the sound okay? Yeah. Ah, okay. So, uh, okay. So the uh, the first thing I'd like to discuss is uh, how can we model the this particular frame with uh, distributed plasticity concept. So, if you look closer with uh, uh, like a beam of uh, the structure, uh, you can essentially. Um, uh, depending on the option that you are selecting force versus displacement based elements uh, and then um, uh, within the individual element you have to uh, decide on uh, how many integration points you will use and then uh, if you are using a fiber cross-section you have to pretty much uh, decide what kind of uh, material model you will use to uh, mimic the engineering stress strain uh, curve um, uh, that uh, its fiber sees so uh, this means that you know you have to decide on a number of things, and um, uh, I will start. I will start uh, like if I use this slide, I will start from the materials, and I will actually go to the um, uh, fiber section, and then I will go to the force-based element that I'm using in this case, uh, and then I'll show you a few things. Um, how can you build pretty much uh, each one of those? So steel material models available in open OpenSeas. Uh, there is uh, still 0-1, uh, which is a simple bilinear model, like you can see it here on the left. And uh, uh, there is a still 0-2 Menegoto Pinto model uh, with uh, combined isotropic kinematic hardening. So the advantage of the second one compared to the first one is that you can capture the uh, Bausinger effect. Uh, that uh, it's typical for steel components. And the, um, uh, the other thing is that uh, you can capture a combined uh, isotropic kinematic hardening, but I guess you know that can be done also in steel 01. So, uh, so the first one, you know, if you want to use the first one, uh, uh, the first three input parameters, these are directly uh, coming from uh, the stress strain uh, material curve that you engineering stress strain, mat stress strain material curve that you have from uh, uh, coupon testing or uh, past literature. Uh, and then the other thing is that you have the, the set of four parameters that you can actually control uh, isotropic hardening uh, in case that you want to take that in consideration. But as you see with the idealized stress strain curve here, uh, that model is not able to trace um, uh, smoothening. So because and that could be critical if you are actually uh, uh, if you want to capture the Bausinger effect. So. Uh, so instead of using this one, you can actually go with the uh, steel, steel zero 02 material. So the first three input parameters are more or less the same with the steel zero 01. But then this one, uh, because you want to actually capture the uh, smoothening uh, due to Bausinger effect, you have uh, to uh, take into consideration uh, three other parameters that pretty much control uh, that smoothening, uh, uh, as you see here, and then. The other four uh, parameters that uh, you see pretty much on the slide are again uh, controlling isotropic hardening. Uh, now the uh, the thing is that you know the uh, this set of uh, seven parameters uh, is typically uh, 
uh, is typically um, uh, essentially uh, coming from uh, calibration. So in that sense, you need to have some uh, information related to your component and in particular uh, material uh, behavior so that you can actually calibrate these parameters. But if you check the website, uh, there are already some recommended parameters for you to, uh, to actually use. So uh, for the sake of this uh, presentation, I'm actually using a test. I'm showing the moment rotation uh, for a steel beam that um, uh, was tested in the past and uh, essentially this is the red, da red data, uh, sorry, the red curve. And then uh, I've used the steel 02 material and uh, I calibrated the uh, seven parameters that I highlight here in the corner so that you know, I can match the, uh, the component behavior. But note that uh, in this case, uh, because uh, that component hasn't uh, deteriorated because of local buckling, uh, then you know, I don't have to worry about this. Uh, and you know, still 02 is a material that you actually can't do that either way. So, um, so the next thing you, uh, you have to worry about is, uh, since you decided on the material model that you want to use within your uh, fiber cross-section, the next thing you have to worry about is pretty much how can you actually form a fiber cross-section and uh, also how many fibers you should use for that, for this, uh, uh, within this cross-section. So, uh, this is a little bit of, uh, I, I mean, for, for a lot of people that are using uh, uh, fiber, uh, fibers to model uh, uh, steel lower reinforced concrete components. One uh, question is, you know, how many fibers is enough to actually capture the local as well as global effects for a steel structure in this case? So, there is this study by uh, Kostik and Professor Filippo in 2012. And uh, I think this study addresses both uh, steel and reinforced concrete uh, components. So, if you worry about W shapes, uh, what uh, this study showed is that um, if you uh, actually use uh, uh, um, 12 uh, fibers similar to the one that uh, uh, the figure, the highlighted figure shows, gives remar remarkable accuracy in terms of uh, local response estimates. Uh, and but the thing is, if you are worried about biaxial bending, not in a 2D uh, model. Uh, or failures associated with weak axis bending, then you should probably move with uh, uh, option B or option C. Okay. So uh, in this presentation, because I'm doing uh, two-dimensional modeling, and you know we've done also some a uh, small sensitivity study related to the topic, uh, we we actually use the first option here with um, uh, twelve fibers uh, similar to the one that you see here in the uh, highlighted. Uh, um, Figure. So uh, now in, uh, in OpenSeas, uh, I, I believe Frank has distributed uh, or will distribute this uh, pro uh, super procedure that he has built with uh, steel2.tcl that includes pretty much uh, a number of things, uh, a number of procedures that you need to actually use uh, when you build a steel moment resisting frame. And uh, what you need to look for in this case is pretty much a procedure that is called uh, fiber uh, steel W section 2D because we are using uh, two d we are doing two dimensional modeling. And uh, as you will see, this procedure requires you to uh, specify your uh, section type, material tag, which is pretty much the material that I just defined before. Uh, and then, um, uh, how many fibers do you want to use uh, for your flans and uh, web? And then, you know, if you look a little bit into the specifics, essentially that procedure will build um, uh, your fiber cross section and you should be good to go. Okay. Uh, now, if you uh, look a bit closer, like uh, depending on the um, uh, W shape uh, geometric characteristics, these are taken into consideration so that you can build that cross section. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the next thing you have to uh, decide is essentially uh, if you are going to assign this uh, fiber section into a force or displacement based uh, uh, beam column element. So I believe Michael Scott talked about it, but uh, uh, there is this good paper by Professor Filippo uh, and one of his students in 1997 where there is some good discussion why you should want to consider force based elements over displacement based elements 
related to the accuracy of, the, uh, of what you are predicting in terms of uh, forces within the element. And then, you know, if you follow again uh, some of the modeling recommendations by uh, Professor Filippo's uh, group, if you decide to go with the force uh, beam column element, uh, one element is adequate. And if you use something like five integration points along the member, this should be sufficient most of the times for modeling uh, still more interesting frames. But this doesn't mean that you should use this. Uh, I mean, these are house numbers. You should probably uh, do your sensitivity study up front, depending on the case that you are modeling, it's because maybe some of these uh, uh, numbers uh, need to be tuned uh, better. Okay. And then, if I go back to Frank's uh, super procedure that includes all the uh, uh, special procedures that you need to have to uh, build a moment resting frame, uh, what you need to look for th in this case is. Uh, uh, force beam W section 2D and um, again uh, here you will see that uh, this particular procedure uses a force beam column element uh, uh, here at the base uh, at the at the, uh, at the bottom of your slide that uh, essentially in order to define it you need to define the nodes that uh, that element is connecting how many integration points and uh, also you need to assign a geometric transformation which is related to uh, second order effects. So there are three options available. The first one is a linear transformation but you don't consider P delta effects in that case. Then you have the P delta transformation and uh, the third one is uh, co-rotational. Okay, so for the uh, sake of this presentation I'm using uh, the second option which is uh, P delta. Okay, now uh, if you try to put everything together, uh, again, like uh, I'm trying to use uh, for consistency some of the things that uh, Frank distributed uh, to you or will distribute to you um, as part of this workshop. So what I did is I took his uh, MRF1.tcl uh, script that uh, builds a, a moment resisting frame in two dimensions in 35 lines. And uh, what I did is uh, I pretty much adjusted uh, this script based on uh, the discussion I actually showed you earlier uh, in terms of material. So I'm using the Steel02 material and I'm tuning the parameters here uh, based on the calibration example I did. Uh, so 55 uh, uh, is pretty much the uh, yield stress of the 55 KSI is the yield stress of the uh, uh, steel beam uh, that I'm using, uh, 29,000 uh, KSI is the uh, Yang's modulus for the steel material I'm using and then the rest of the parameters came from calibration from that particular component that uh, uh, I was interested. And then um, I changed pretty much uh, some of the uh, vectors here so that you know I can have the uh, actual cross sections uh, that the mo my mono resistant frame has. Uh, and you know this structure has four stories so you have to make sure that uh, uh, you are uh, pretty much using the right size of uh, these vectors so that you know you can reflect four stories. And then a uh, uh, couple of other things. Uh, if I want to build uh, beams and columns, again I said I'm going to use uh, force uh, beam column elements in two dimensions. So um, the highlighted uh, areas here pretty much will do that for you and I'm using five integration points as I discussed earlier, okay. So uh, if you, I mean, it's fairly simple to uh, pretty much create a regular moment frame with that script, and you know, I encourage you to use it because it's uh, it's uh, I mean, it's verified, and uh, normally you won't run into any surprises uh, uh, like if you actually use that script. So uh, I've done a couple of modifications. Uh, one modification is that uh, I'd like to uh, model the panel zone behavior in that case. Uh, so this is typical. Uh, this is a typical issue for uh, steel moment frames uh, that uh, have been designed with uh, old seismic provisions, because uh, like particularly before the Northridge earthquake, um, because um, uh, if uh, if uh, the panel zone area hasn't been designed with the uh, adequate doubler plates, what happens is that uh, you will have excessive uh, deformations here and uh, this could be a problem because if you are missing that uh, important deformation then 
your results are not going to be uh, accurate enough. Actually, it would be quite off. And then, you know, if you want to do that in line with what we were discussing, so I'm not using a center line model here. I'm actually uh, using elastic beam column elements to uh, pretty much form the finite geometry of the panel zone. And that geometry is related to your beam depth and column depth. Uh, and then you have to use uh, four nodes so that you know your force beam column elements, uh, force based beam column elements will pretty much uh, come to the uh, connect to the panel zone. And then um, uh, what you have to do is uh, you have to model also the uh, nonlinear behavior of a panel zone. So this is historically done with a trilinear model. Uh, as has been shown uh, in uh, uh, studies in early seven, uh, late 70s by uh, Professor Kravinkler. And um, uh, if uh, you want to uh, obtain the input parameters of this uh, uh, trilinear response, uh, you have to look at the document uh, by Gupta and Kravinkler in 1999, or you can also use the AISC provisions it's more or less the same equations that uh, will uh, you will be able to compute vy, vp, and the associated uh, deformations. Okay. Now, uh, I, I believe that uh, in the super procedure that Frank has, uh, this is not included. But uh, if you go to uh, some of the previously posted uh, OpenSys examples, uh, the, there is a procedure there that you can actually create the panel zone fairly easily. So this procedure uh, will ask you to uh, provide the uh, steel properties of your uh, elements within the panel zone, a geometric transformation, and then inside the procedure, all the nodes of the panel zone will be created. Uh, and then if you go all the way down, essentially all these uh, nodes will form the panel zone with elastic beam column elements. So this procedure is available online, but I believe that uh, it's not part of the uh, steel uh, 2D.tcl file, but I, I guess it's pretty easy to add it there as well. Okay, so, uh, so with that, you know, if, if I actually uh, put, it, put everything together and, you know, I actually do some uh, assessment for that particular uh, moment resisting frame using a distributed plasticity approach, uh, what I have is uh, I'm showing a nonlinear static procedure uh, with a first mode lateral load pattern. And uh, here in this graph, you see pretty much the base CR versus uh, roof drift ratio of the uh, uh, structure. And the base CR is normalized with respect to the seismic weight. So I can compare it with the design base CR coefficient. So a uh, couple of things we see is that, you know, uh, I mean, this curve is reasonable because uh, if I actually uh, put the uh, base air coefficient uh, based on my uh, based on the AAC prof uh, sorry based on AAC 7-10 this will be in the range of uh, 0 0.075 and from this curve I see that my overstrength is about 2 which is in line with what uh, the seismic provisions uh, say a uh, couple of other things the blue curve uh, shows uh, what's the um, uh, capacity curve of the frame without the delta effects and then the red curve shows you uh, uh, how the capacity curve looks like with p delta effects. So the difference here is attributed to uh, p delta effects. But you have to uh, uh, you have to keep in mind that this uh, curve does not capture strength degradation of steel components. But this may be okay if you are interested to analyze your structure for uh, design level events and not for something uh, extreme. Now, um, uh, on the uh, right-hand side, I'm showing the uh, floor displacements versus uh, normalized floor displacement. Um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm showing the uh, normalized floor displacement along the height of the structure at uh, discrete uh, roof drift ratios that I selected, like from 1% to 4%. And if I look at the uh, 1%, I normally do that when I model moment frames because um, the structure uh, before 1% roof drift is fairly, it's more or less elastic. So if you see a uniform uh, uh, displacement profile, it means that you have also a uniform drift profile. Uh, so this is, means that the, whatever your model says is in line with the way that you design for elastic response. Okay. Now, while the... Um, uh, while you increase the roof drift, what happens is that uh, 
we can see that you know we have a formation of a three-story uh, mechanism. That's because uh, I see this king here. That that indicates that uh, uh, essentially I should expect to see a three-story mechanism uh, in that frame. Okay. Now, uh, the other thing I've done is I'm using the same model, uh, but now I'm actually using, uh, using it to uh, uh, do some uh, nonlinear response history analysis. So I'm using for this uh, uh, case uh, Canoga Park earth earth uh, record from the Northridge 1994 earthquake. I like using this record because uh, the unscaled uh, intensity of this record matches the uh, ASE 7 10 uh, design spectrum for, for uh, soil type D for the location that, that this building has been designed. And uh, if I look at my uh, story drift ratios versus uh, uh, along the height of the, uh, the four-story uh, building, what you see is that for scale factor of one, you have a uniform drift profile more or less up to about 2% uh, radiance. And for a scale factor of uh, 1.5 of the same uh, ground motion, which corresponds to a maximum considered earthquake for uh, uh, maximum considered earthquake for uh, uh, California in the particular location of interest, you see that uh, drift profile pretty much uh, shows that I'm exceeding uh, four percent uh, radians in this case. Okay. Now uh, here I I include this one by purpose because. You have to uh, make sure that uh, you realize that with the approach that we followed so far, because the steel zero two material uh, does not capture um, uh, degradation effects, this means that uh, whatever we did so far does not include the effect of cyclic deterioration on flexural strength and stiffness of steel uh, components. So this means that in reality your building might be there or might have might maybe you know deformed much more if your uh, the components that uh, you have selected according to design are fairly flexible okay so uh, uh, in that sense what I'm doing is uh, I'm modeling the same uh, structure but with a concentrated plasticity approach and again you know I'm using the leaning column to carry P delta and all that but um, uh, uh, now, essentially, I'm doing a couple of things different. So differently. So the first one, if I'm worried about the same beam or column, uh, what I have to do is I have to introduce a few more nodes, because now I have to use um, um, uh, what I have to do is I have to use zero length elements uh, to uh, pretty much uh, represent the um, uh, flexural behavior of uh, the individual components. So these elements. Zero length elements uh, with the idealized moment rotation uh, relationship. So you need to know that that's the problem. And then in between, uh, say your uh, uh, secondary node here and secondary node here. In between, you you can use an elastic beam column element. Okay. Now, uh, the um, if you look at again the uh, still 2D dot TCL. Uh, uh, master procedure, like you will find a procedure to create elastic beam column elements. So you need to look for elastic beam uh, W section 2D. Again, if you look at this uh, procedure, it will ask you to define the two nodes that uh, you want this element to be created with. Uh, you need to specify a section type, uh, material modulus, and you need also to pass the uh, transform uh, geometric transformation. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, what you, if you want to uh, actually uh, assign uh, material property, sorry, if you want to assign uh, 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 the used moment rotation relationship to your zero length element, uh, you have a few options. You can still use the still zero one, still zero two materials that I did uh, I did use before, but uh, now you cannot use them in a stress strain domain anymore. You have to use them in a moment rotation domain uh, because. Uh, zero length element essentially uh, wants you to uh, uh, provide a component model similar to the ones that you see in AAC 41 or AT72 uh, modeling provisions. Or uh, the other thing you could uh, do is if you worry about degradation, you could use uh, modify the Barra Medina Kravinkler uh, deterioration model with uh, bilinear hysteretic response, or uh, that's also known as bilinear in open seas. 
So the difference between this component model and the other two is that uh, you can actually consider strength and stiffness degradation of steel components. And for the, for the uh, so I'm gonna use this one in this case just to see a couple of differences in terms of uh, structural performance once the degradation kicks in. Uh, plus you can also highlight the uh, similarities or differences between the distributed uh, um, plasticity approach and the uh, concentrated plasticity approach for the same frame. So that, that's interesting. Okay. So a little bit of background before I move on is that uh, this material model requires you to provide a set of input parameters. So if you look at here on the uh, left hand side, these parameters are associated with the elastic stiffness of your component. Uh, so that this depends on the boundary conditions. Uh, this is a multi-linear model, so you have to uh, provide the uh, yield uh, moment, uh, also the capping, pack capping moment, which is associated with the point that local buckling uh, initiates in the component. And then there are a bunch of other input parameters that you have to worry about. One is the um, uh, uh, plastic deformation from yield to capping uh, rotation, so that's called theta p. Also, the uh, uh, plastic deformation from capping all the way to uh, zero strength, uh, that's called post-capping uh, rotation. And then uh, steel components, uh, uh, normally when you actually cycle them, uh, they, they tend to stabilize. So that's why there is this residual path here. So that means that you need to provide another input parameter, which is uh, related to residual strength of that component. And if you have ductile tearing, you can actually provide an ultimate uh, deformation that your component will drop uh, to zero. Okay. And uh, if you are interested about the cyclic behavior, that model is able to deteriorate um, uh, when you have inelastic um, uh, cycles, uh, when the component is subjected to inelastic cycles. And as you see here on the picture uh, on your right hand side, you have a basic strength degradation that the model captures, also post-capping strength degradation that the model captures, and also, this is interesting, you have also unloading stiffness degradation. Uh, that could be uh, uh, the case if you have a steel component that goes in lateral torsional buckling. So you will start with an elastic stiffness that is here, and then uh, lateral torsional buckling essentially likes to uh, deteriorate the unloading stiffness, so that, that you can actually simulate. The problem is, though, that you need to uh, deduce the moment rotation relationship of the component under consideration. Uh, otherwise, you know, your uh, input parameters are based on luck, at least most of them. Okay. Uh, now, the other thing you could do, you, you could basically consider slab effects, and we've done this uh, recently, so you can actually um, um, change the um, uh, way that uh, the rate of degradation uh, looks like if you have a slab and you do have a slab if you worry about composite effects. And um, normally, when the slab is in compression, your strength, uh, the beam strength, will be uh, larger than the um, uh, loading direction that you have the slab in tension. Uh, and that is reflected here with uh, one example and one calibration that you see. But again, you have the same problem. So you have to deduce a moment rotation relationship of the component under consideration, otherwise, I mean, you are not really doing much if the, your input parameters are not uh, reliable. Okay, so for this reason, uh, what we've done is uh, we've collected a number of tests, uh, about 300, and uh, we've posted them online. So if you, if you want to use this model or if you have uh, new models, because I guess you talked a little bit about code development, what you can do is you can uh, visit the uh, website uh, and uh, uh, the way this works, uh, the way this works is that uh, uh, if you know your beam, like you, I, I'm gonna make a small illustration. W30 by 99. If you know your connection, say reduced beam section. If you actually search for what tests are available with these uh, characteristics, in that case there are only four. So if you click on one, like uh, what you are getting is, uh, you are getting pretty much uh, general information that you are interested to see for this uh, element. You are getting a link to the publication that uh, you can uh, actually get a bit more information in case that uh, there is something that you are missing. But then if you go all the way down, 
you need a monad rotation uh, to work with with your non-linear model in this case uh, modified IMK model so uh, if you actually go all the way down you can actually uh, download the data and uh, if you download the data the data comes in uh, spreadsheet so you can use the spreadsheet in a digitized uh, form so you can actually compare with your uh, with uh, what, what are the input parameters that uh, you should be using so that you can do a reliable prediction okay so if I go back to the uh, presentation uh, so so we've done I mean I, I mean in prior work you know I've done this uh, quite a bit and we've used most of this data for that particular model that I'm showing and here you see two typical examples when you have a slab in place or when you don't have slab in place and for the uh, IMK model that I'm showing it comes with a set of uh, formulas that you know if you know the geometric characteristics of your uh, uh, beam and column you can actually use the right formula to predict each one of those parameters that I was showing you before but you see how complex it gets because by the time you uh, move from a stress strain uh, uh, domain you need all this uh, otherwise you know that your prediction will become uh, it's, it's not reliable okay uh, so the other thing you could do is uh, I mean we, we've actually uh, uh, implemented those in uh, web-based tools that you can visit from the same website that I'm showing you so, so uh, this tool essentially uses these formulas and by selecting the right uh, section that you have you can actually get the uh, parameters that you need readily available for uh, uh, OpenSys so um, uh, I'm not going to actually uh, do an illustration for that but you're welcome to actually visit the website and uh, do it so uh, if you go back to the super procedure that Frank put for you like uh, there is this uh, procedure uh, still W section MR that essentially has the um, uh, uh, modified IMK material model in there and uh, it takes into account all these equations that I showed you so that you can define the input uh, uh, rationally and then uh, as you see you need to provide the number of parameters associated primarily with the geometry of the component or if you want to include the composite action uh, you have to provide the flag that essentially uh, does this for you and everything is done internally but I suggest you go through the references because uh, there are some uh, information or details that you need to know before you actually attempt to do that and then if you put it all together and you know I go through the same examples I showed you before uh, so I'm using again the four-story uh, special moment frame with a concentrated plasticity but in this case I'm using uh, the degradation uh, material model uh, and then uh, in the same figure I'm comparing with the distributed plasticity model but uh, the material uh, stress strain material curve I'm using essentially uh, is a still zero to pretty much the one I did before and uh, you can start seeing you know when the models start having uh, significant differences and you know what are the regions that you can have uh, both of them you know work more or less the same so there is this limit in that case around 3% uh, roof drift that uh, the pushover curve starts deviating so if I look at the curve up to that point uh, there are some issues here associated with uh, the fact that you know still 02 is a smooth model uh, so it captures the bow singer effect so I'm expecting to see some differences around yielding but these differences are not uh, very large in this case but you have this point here that uh, is pretty much uh, 3% uh, around 3% roof drift so that the comp uh, component degradation uh, kicks in so this difference is attributed to uh, strength uh, deterioration so if this is important for you because you are interested to evaluate performance at larger defor uh, large deformations then you not you need to start thinking about this okay uh, now interestingly when you look at the uh, displacement profiles for uh, this particular case with the blue uh, color I'm highlighting the displacement profile uh, for the uh, fiber based uh, uh, model and then the uh, with uh, red light I'm uh, actually uh, highlighting the uh, predicted performance in terms of uh, uh, floor displacements uh, along the height of the building with the deteriorating model so there are some differences primarily because of the gradation but the formation of the three-story uh, mechanism did not change in this case 
Uh, but this could very well happen in other cases because uh, when degradation uh, starts, you have uh, a redistribution of uh, moments and in general forces. So uh, you could end up having a different mechanism compared compared the one that uh, you would think you have at the beginning. Okay. Uh, now, again, for the sake of simplicity, uh, for the sake of comparisons, I'm actually uh, using uh, the same ground motion scale factor of one. Um, which means, you know, close to design level earthquake. Uh, and then, you know, you see the two models, there are, there are some differences in terms of uh, uh, peak story drift ratios, but for all practical purposes, considering that, you know, same structure, two different modeling approaches, I mean, you can say that, you know, it's fairly close when degradation is not a problem. However, um, um, if you actually use the same record, uh, scale factor of 1.5, the blue curve is the one that uh, we predicted before uh, with a distributed plasticity approach, but uh, with a material curve that doesn't reflect uh, cyclic deterioration effects. And the red curve is the one uh, including degradation. So what's interesting here is that uh, if your structure starts going at uh, uh, the formations that are associated with uh, uh, rare events, essentially maximum considered events or uh, extreme events, then this issue becomes important and you shouldn't ignore it when you model a steel structure. So this difference, which is huge in this case, uh, is uh, essentially related to cyclic deterioration uh, on structural response. Uh, now one more slide associated to that. So. Uh, if you want to uh, pretty much see what degradation does, if you look at your uh, base CR in this case versus uh, first story drift ratio, uh, what I'm plotting is for the same uh, ground motion intensity, I'm plotting the uh, for, uh, performance of the four story uh, special moment frame uh, with um, uh, distributed versus uh, uh, concentrated plasticity approach, but in one case my stress strain model doesn't capture degradation. In the other, uh, my zero length element and associated uh, phenomenological model captures degradation. And you see that, you know, after uh, this point, the difference is because of strength degradation. Up to a certain level, the two uh, models are more or less the same. But when you start looking into larger uh, deformations, this issue becomes important. And uh, if you worry about collapse, essentially um, the problem will be that uh, uh, unless if you have degradation there to kick in, it's not going to happen. Okay. Uh, now, a couple of slides so that I can wrap it up. Uh, the first one, um, so we use the second approach, not because it's better, but because we, won't, we, we had some rational ways of um, uh, simulating degradation. So we used this one in the past. Uh, to uh, analyze the uh, uh, collapse risk, to compute the collapse risk of steel special moment frames designed in California. And, you know, for the four-story building that uh, I showed you earlier, essentially uh, we did uh, what a lot of people are doing uh, these days or the past, I guess, 10, 20 years, incremental dynamic analysis by, by using a set of 40 ground motion. So, if you have a model that is validated and uh, you feel that uh, it has certain reliability, uh, uh, both in large displacements, uh, sorry, small displacements as well as large displacements that collapse will actually occur, you can start uh, running a switch of ground motion so you can uh, see what's happening in average uh, with uh, essentially your uh, your case, your case study. So. Here in this curve, I'm plotting um, the uh, spectral acceleration versus maximum story drift ratio for the same four-story building I showed before. When these uh, curves become flat, essentially uh, you have dynamic instability. And if you take these 44 points, you actually uh, do counted and uh, computed statistics. You can actually come up with what we call a collapse fragility curve. And these curves are uh, uh, important so that you can assess uh, collapse risk of uh, uh, steel or reinforced concrete uh, building. So, a um, uh, few concluding remarks. I mean, pretty much uh, uh, modeling steel moment resisting frames in open seas. Uh, you can use a number of readily available tools, uh, procedures, that uh, examples and the web-based tools that uh, have been built for uh, for this purpose. 
I believe some of them, you know, uh, I have in this presentation, I tried for consistency to actually show you things that uh, Frank is putting together for uh, still more interesting frames. frames. Now, still components to consider, of, I mean, that's kind of obvious, you know, you need to worry about beams, columns, and panel zones. Panel zones, if we talk about code compliant buildings, technically, you know, assuming that the panel zone is um, designed uh, uh, as rigid, you could omit the uh, deformations, but uh, sometimes it could be important. Uh, distributed versus concentrated elasticity approach. So for low rise, code compliant steel buildings with perimeter moment resting frames, the differences should not be large for design level earthquakes. Distributed plasticity models though capture uh, cyclic hardening, uh, PM interaction, and uh, with a concentrated plasticity approach, it's practically not uh, easy to do that. Okay. Now if performance evaluation at large deformation is the objective, component deterioration must be considered for a steel moment resisting frame. And uh, concentrated plasticity with uh, degradation um, uh, and phenomenological model that can capture degradation will actually do reasonably well for low to mid-rise steel moment frames. But remember that uh, this approach doesn't capture uh, PM interaction, so if you worry about uh, high-rise buildings, then these models, even though you capture degradation, won't, won't be as accurate as you think they, they could be. Okay. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your uh, attention. I, I put some references in what I showed, and also if you have questions, uh, feel free to email me. And if I can answer que questions with this uh, setup here, I'll be happy to do. Thank you, Richard. Was the sound was the sound okay? Yeah. Sorry. You didn't have a little bit. Does anybody have any questions for Dimitri? Michael got a question. Michael Scott, right? Michael Scott. Professor Michael Scott. Professor Michael Scott, okay. Hey, Dimitri, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, a lot of good, good results here, but when you're comparing fiber models with steel O2 that are indefinitely strain hardening, comparing that to deterioration models that have built-in strain softening, do you think that's a fair comparison? Uh, no, no. Uh, I mean, if I go back to uh, to the slide, I, I I only did the comparison not because I wanted to show that one is better than the other, because of course this is not a fair comparison. I only did the uh, comparison to show you that. Difference. What's that? After that three percent drift ratio. Exactly. Like I, 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 yes, I only did the uh, comparison not to say that you know one is better than the other, but I only did the comparison because with the existing uh, material models that uh, are there, uh, if you want to capture the gradation, I just decided to do something differently so you can show you that you know the curve after a certain point will be different if one of the two doesn't have it, but. As you pointed out, of course it's not a fair comparison because if you had the stress strain curve that could uh, reflect the uh, degradation effects and you could embed it in a distributed plasticity approach, of course that would be the right thing to do and would be of course better than using a zero length element. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, but, but uh, it, you, it, this should be clear that I'm not comparing what is better, I'm just showing what could be different if the gradation comes in. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I have one other question. Sure. Wow. Dr. Lidon, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a general question about your uh, concentrated plasticity model. It's not uh, necessarily about uh, steel components. But I, I was wondering, in case we don't have a uh, uh, database uh, available for specific uh, structural components, okay. uh, what would you recommend uh, to come up with uh, the with, uh, backbone parameters to get started with uh, concentrated plasticity models? 
well, well, I mean that that's the problem that uh, that you know you can face when you use the zero length elements because you have to come up with uh, some sort of realistic uh, parameter input parameter uh, that your model needs. So the on, I mean I guess the only way of, of doing this is that uh, you have to find some uh, available data from the literature. It could be uh, like you know few tests, or it could be more than few tests. But that depends also on the component that you are modeling. Sometimes you know you cannot find more than two or three. And then um, uh, if you calibrate your uh, concentrated plasticity model, and you can have uh, some sort of uh, baseline input parameters, if you cannot somehow um, uh, adjust your parameters for different components then you have to uh, uh, start thinking, you know, okay, if I had a steel beam with a thicker flange uh, than the one that I calibrated, uh, what would be the implication on, uh, say, uh, plastic rotation capacity probably would go up. But how much up? You need to have a test to do it. So that's the problem. So the long story short, you need to uh, find some tests to uh, calibrate your uh, material model. And then, uh, if you don't have more than few, uh, uh, what you have to do is you have to find a rational way. So essentially, you have to base it on your uh, engineering uh, logic. Sometimes it's uh, wrong, sometimes it's okay, so that you can actually adjust your uh, parameters for other components. Thank you, sir. No problem. Thank you. So we will call the later. Okay. So the. Uh, the other thing is, I just wanted to say that uh, I I also recorded the uh, the pr uh, presentation. So in case that the sound was not very good, uh, we can uh, distribute the link for the people that uh, participated in the workshop. Perfect, perfect, that's good. Okay. So uh, have a good rest of the day, and uh, we will uh, we will talk. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Bye.